This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. This month's featured article in the Heart Rhythm Journal comes to us from South Africa. Lead and corresponding author Marshall Heredian from Stellenbosch University is joining us to talk to us about the potential benefits of renal denervation and atrial fibrillation. Marshall, welcome and congratulations. Roderick, thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to share with you our research. Well, tell us a little bit about where we've been with renal denervation and what inspired you to start constructing the study. Yeah, so I think you cannot uh, start talking about renal denervation without mentioning the effect on blood pressure that it has. As you know, the history, the tumultuous course we've had with Simplicity 3 uh, showing that the renal denervation actually does not reduce blood pressure. But we know with subsequent trials that were better designed, uh, we do indeed see that renal denervation lowers blood pressure, both in the on-med and off-med studies, uh, as well as with ultrasound, we see that renal denervation lowers blood pressure. So we're very happy to now finally have established that effect that it lowers blood pressure, but obviously we as a group were more interested in the effect of renal denervation on cardiac arrhythmia and specifically the most ubiquitous, ubiquitous and prevalent one, atrial fibrillation. Uh, and it just makes perfect sense that most patients with AF that we see uh, in your daily practice, they also have hypertension. So using renal denervation upstream uh, to prevent subclinical AF is this novel idea that we're pursuing and um, we're actually building on previous data from the er Eradicate AF study that showed that if you add renal denervation to pulmonary venous isolation for patients uh, with paroxysmal AF, you reduce post-procedural atrial fibrillation, flutter, and tachycardia. Uh, in a large study that was published in JAMA in 2020 by Steinberg and his group, uh, and uh, we tested the hypothesis that if you use renal denervation alone upstream in patients who have a high risk to develop AF, you can actually prevent subclinical AF, which we think is the precursor of developing paroxysmal AF. So the idea of uh, reducing sympathetic tone, we know some, uh, the increased sympathetic tone is essential in the development of cardiac arrhythmias, not only does it promote the substrate development of left atrial dilation, diastolic dysfunction, uh, you know, left ventricular hypertrophy, and more importantly, stretch of the pulmonary veins as they enter into the left atrium, but also we know that surges of adrenaline that you experience, for example, in, with hypoxic uh, episodes, such as in obstructive sleep apnea or hypoglycemia, or acute hypertensive episodes that that causes an abrupt rise in the left atrial pressure, which is then transmitted to the pulmonary veins. It stretches them. And then you get these short bursts. Let's call it staccato AF, short, fast runs of AF. And AF begets more AF. So um, by reducing the sympathetic tone both centrally and at the cardiac level, uh, we think that this new therapy can actually also uh, prevent uh, subclinical AF and subsequently the whole downhill course of developing persistent and chronic AF. And I think what's really novel here, Marshall, is again, your research question is that you're doing this as standalone renal denervation, not with additional PVI, which has been what's been explored. That's right. So it takes us a little bit through the rigor of the protocol, because you have a randomized scheme, it's sham controlled and you've got ILRs. That's indeed correct. So we obviously uh, decided to do a randomized control study, obviously to limit bias and obviously the placebo effect as well. Um, so I don't know, I know in America, you have little experience with renal innovation currently because you're still waiting for FDA approval of the device. Um, but patients who, who get renal denervation, they know that they get it. Why? Because it's a painful procedure. The reason it's painful is because you are damaging, you're destroying sympathetic nerves that supply the kidney. So that group would actually know they had renal denervation, right? So obviously adding a sham group uh, and making them believe that they had renal denervation by playing 
the sounds of the machine to them and injecting dye into the renal artery and telling them if you feel the warmth, you may be getting renal denervation. You know, was an effort for us to obviously get a control group where we could then make them believe that they had the procedure. But as you mentioned, everybody, every patient of the 80 patients that we included, they had uh, implantable loop recorders inserted uh, which were pre-programmed to automatically detect uh, high atrial rate episodes um, lasting at least six minutes. Um, and we scan these devices every six months for a period of 24 years. And this is what we are re you know, reporting here, the 24 month results. Obviously the study was pre specified to follow these patients for three years. Uh, and obviously those results are still uh, pending. And Marshall, was there any barrier to enrollment, given that there was sham that a patient understands that there's a 50% chance they don't get any therapy potentially? Uh, the patients that we enrolled were very, very excited to be able to participate in this study because obviously they now had free follow up for a period of three years and, you know, coming six monthly to see the doctor. And I think they... They were fairly older patients with average age about 65, 70 years. And they really liked, you know, to be seen by the doctor, being checked, making sure that about, you know, them taking their therapy, reporting about their results and telling them that this trial could potentially help many people. Uh, and so uh, the Hawthorne effect, you know, where people modify their behavior to please uh, the investigator is maybe something, you know, that could have influenced the results. But remember, we had a randomized control trial. So supposedly not both groups thought they had the procedure. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think having a randomized study, you know, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, it eliminates or reduces bias, that selection bias and uh, you know, modifying behavior that could ultimately, you know, uh, change the results. So your answer in short is no, I think people were excited to participate. As you saw, we also thanked them in the end of the study. And we're really looking forward to take this the next level where we obviously will recruit multi-center individuals and uh, groups and see if we can take it further. So Marshall, take us through these curves that we're looking at, these Kaplan-Meier curves, because you do a great follow-up out to two years. Right. So um, we randomized 80 patients uh, to either renal denervation. So there were 42 uh, patients in the red group, as you can see there, and 38 in the blue group, the sham group. And basically, we scanned the, the ILRs every six months. And you can see initially the first three months, uh, the, the, the curves actually cross and it looked like, you know, uh, sham control was better than renal denervation. But subsequently, if you follow them further, you'll see that during these 24 months of follow up, uh, we had an incidence of about 19 to 20 percent uh, of patients developing our primary endpoint in the RD group. That's one in five. Um, that's eight out of 42 RD patients and almost double that amount uh, in the sham group uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.40. So there was a relative risk reduction of 60% um, in patients who had real innovation preventing uh, subclinical AF. What was also interesting, Roderick, was that we found that the incidence of fast AF which we really thought was a surrogate marker of increased sympathetic tone. Because remember the AV node is supplied by sympathetic nerves and also the vagal nerves as well, of course. Um, but because fast AF was, the, the, the incidence was higher in the sham group, that really showed us significantly higher. That showed us that we were really reheating nerves and most likely reducing central sympathetic tone that translated to slower AV conduction, you know, through the AV node. So that's also another interesting feature for us because we frequently struggle to rate control patients. You know, to, to, nowadays we must decide whether we're going to go for rhythm or rate control. Uh, and even with drugs, sometimes we end up ablating the AV node and putting in a permanent pacemaker. 
Space, space and becomes yes. space, so, space make it dependent. And can you just show us a little bit about the data from Burden? And my question to you also will be, was this correlated with reductions in blood pressure as well, all these striking reductions that you've shown? Right. So um, we never pre-specified subclinical AF burden a priori. Actually, uh, if you look at the NCT website, you'll see that subclinical AF burden was not mentioned there. But the reviewer, one of the reviewers thought that this was a very important endpoint to report. Uh, at the time of the design of our study, this concept of AF burden or subclinical AF burden was not that well known. Uh, and obviously now we believe that this is a very important marker that predicts uh, how many patients will in the end develop paroxysmal AF. So from this graph, you can see that uh, significantly more patients, 81% um, in the RD group actually had 0% subclinical AF burden compared to the uh, 23 sham patients or the 60% uh, in the sham group. Uh, and then in the upper tertile, uh, with a burden of more than 1%, totaling more than 1.7 hours per week of subclinical AF, again there, we found a significant difference uh, showing that patients in the RD had a lower uh, prevalence of uh, high burden at 7% versus 24% in the sham group. So this was a serendipitous discovery for us. And we, we were really very excited about that. The middle group didn't show any significance. And obviously, you know, the reviewer insisted that we added that the burden was low. So in this study, AF burden was low. Remember, we didn't with the ILRs, uh, we, we inserted the ILRs at randomization. So there wasn't this period before the study that we actually determined burden, which is also important if you want to see how the burden changed. And like right. I said, this was mostly because a priori we did not uh, pre-specify this endpoint, but it was added subsequently uh, to the paper as well. Well, this is a fine example of how a reviewer can actually add value to a paper. Uh, and I think, I think having ILRs and showing burden um, is a wonderful contribution to, as we understand that AFib may be arbitrary in terms of how we define it. You know, one Indeed. question I had is why did we decide to choose six minutes of as AF rather than 30 seconds? Was there a reason for that? Yes, yes. So um, that comes from a landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I forget the name now, but basically they were looking also at you know, device diagnosed um, AF uh, in patients. Yeah, this is uh, a certain tra a certain trends data. Pardon? It's a certain trends data. That's the assert study. That's right. So, so the assert study they use the six minutes as the cutoff, um, and obviously, you know, we we followed suit by saying we're going to use that as our primary endpoint, um, and yeah. Regarding your question about the blood pressure, the interesting thing is we actually in both groups, both the RD and the sham group, we had significant reduction in systolic blood pressure, similar to simplicity three. And again, you know, when the study was designed um, as a limitation, we also did not check drug levels to make sure that people were taking their drugs or pill counts, you know, all those things. We took them on their word and encouraged them to please keep taking their meds. Um, and obviously, subsequently, we realized that in future studies, this is definitely something that we want to make sure that patients are adherent to their therapy. And that's really the problem we're having with all our patients. They claim to be adherent, but they don't take their tablets all the time. Specifically, you know, when it comes to drugs that give them side effects. Uh, and this is why renal innovation for us is, is, is really this novel, exciting idea, because We've seen from other data like the on-med and off-med off studies that it works 24 hours. Um, unlike certain medicines that, you know, after six hours, like the thiazides, the effect is gone, or, you know, you have to take dual day and night doses to, to, to make sure you're covered for the whole 24 hours. And that's important, I think, because, I mean, if you think about AF, 
most of the AF when it starts is actually probably in the early morning hours or late at night when people have sleep apnea or sleeping. When those tablets have lost the effect long time ago. Well, that is the value, right? Is you can't be non-compliant with renal denervation. If you get it, you're not in the sham control. Well, Marshall, I really want to thank you for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV. Congratulations on, on winning the feature article of this month. It's highly notable, and I've learned several things. Number one, we have a lot to do with the concomitant management of comorbidities. It might be independent of the blood pressure, and it might be the sympathetic you know, nerve activity that triggers the safe fib. ILRs are so useful for understanding burden, and you know we can thank one of the reviewers for that. But renal denervation is certainly not dead, and AFib management is a multi-pronged approach. And I want to congratulate you on a really well-conducted, sham-controlled, randomized trial. And we're really proud to have that in Heart Rhythm Journal. Thank you for joining us from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roderick. All the best to you guys as well. Looking forward to hearing from you again.